Now, these are pictures that I took when I visited uh, BHU. So obviously you will recognize your wonderful buildings and campus. Uh, but also what interested me very much was these bicycles because I'm a keen cyclist, you know, I do long distance cycling. And there were tiffins attached to the bicycle. And I love, love tiffins, the idea of a tiffin to carry the different compartments of um, food. And my connection with uh, BHU goes uh, further back than this. Uh, so for a three month period, uh, Professor Mana visited Cambridge to learn about teaching methods. Uh, and here he is in our, our tea room, along with some other colleagues. Since he created them, these resources have been the most popular downloads from my website. So if I just show you uh, for the month of May, you know, the top downloads are the documents that Mana created, uh, you know, something of the order of 6,500 documents downloaded per month since he created them. Well, a paradigm means a pattern. Okay? So we often hear uh, a certain kind of noise that steel is under threat and uh, lightweight materials are competing with steel and steel content is decreasing in cars. And the reason for this, these kinds of statements are that people want to emphasize their own research by comparing with steels and the comparisons that they make are usually not, not correct. So I intend to show you uh, that far from being under threat, it is actually a very vibrant area of both research and technology. And a very, very simple analysis uh, shows you this, that uh, you know, the annual production of steels is of the order of 2 billion tons, uh, more compared with any other metallic or non-metallic material other than concrete. And not only that, this is the production that was in 1991, and this is what we had in 2020. So it is rising dramatically. And I will point out to you that this kind of an increase in steel consumption is not actually sustainable, but I'll come to that later. Now, why is steel the most successful engineering material? Well, there are three basic reasons, okay? The first one is that uh, it is cheap compared with uh, some of the other materials that we talk about, it is incredibly cheap. Um, and it has an awful lot of phase transformations, some of which are actually hidden. For example, the magnetic transitions, which have a dramatic influence on the allotropic transitions in iron. So for example, pure iron starts off as body-centered cubic, then changes into face-centered cubic, and then goes back to body-centered cubic. And the reason for that is the magnetic transitions, which you don't see, influencing the free energies of the parent and product phases in a very large way. So there's no other uh, system where you get this kind of a reversal from BCC to FCC to BCC. What that means is that you can engineer, uh, control the microstructures on a large scale to get the properties that you want. And the third most important thing is that we can make very large large structures in a very safe way. So here you have two ships colliding at 90 degrees and yet neither of them have sunk. And that is because of the design of shipping steels, which are incredibly tough, can be welded and, and so on. So we can make very large structures using steels. You cannot do that with any other engineering material. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, these are the primary reasons why steel is so successful. It is versatile. You can get a strength of only 50 megapascals to something like three gigapascals while maintaining a whole bank of other properties. Okay, now let's uh, look at the statement that the weight of a car has decreased and that the amount of steel that's used in the car has decreased. So this is a Ford Model T, the first, uh, first mass-produced car. 
And this young lady was my PhD student, it's Vicky Yardley. Uh, and the Model T Ford was the first uh, produced on a production line and it, it kind of set the standard for making mass produced products. And at the time it had 60% of steel and it weighed 800 kilograms. Now, this is my, my small car. It's a Ford Fiesta and I bought it uh, a few years ago. And uh, it's the Ford Fiesta Eco. It uh, provides 70 miles per gallon of uh, um, fuel consumption. And it too is approximately 65% steel. And its weight is 1200 kilograms. Okay. Now, why is the weight 1200 kilograms? Because the safety features uh, in a modern car mean that you have to tolerate a higher weight. So, if I look at the Ford Model T, and let's assume that both cars are using 60% steel, then the absolute weight has increased from 800 kilograms to 1200 kilograms. So there's one third more steel in the one of the most modern cars compared with the Ford Model T, which uh, was many, many decades ago. So the amount of steel being used in cars has not decreased because you simply cannot uh, make good cars without using steel. It, it really has properties which are astounding. You know, the, the formability, the weldability, the combination of strength, toughness, uh, and rolling contact fatigue resistance, and so on. So all the bearings, etc., everything in, in this car is made from steel. And the plastics, uh, they're basically in a decorative form, you know, like the dashboard and so forth. They, so they serve no real structural integrity uh, function. Okay, let's now examine uh, whether the weight of a car is actually decreasing. Well, here are um, some of the most talked about cars. So this is the Tesla uh, electric uh, and high, uh, electric car, and it weighs two and a half thousand kilograms. Now remember that the weight of my car is 1,200 kilograms. So this is much, much heavier than the weight of my car. And similarly, we have uh, the um, Tata Motors Range Rover, which is 2,500 kilograms, even though it is made, uh, you know, the body panels and many components are made from aluminum. So, so aluminum doesn't help you to reduce the weight to the level of a normal steel car. Uh, and this is the Tata Motors Jaguar E-Pace, which is also about two and a half thousand kilograms. Now you compare all these cars with the average European car, which weighs 1,415 kilograms. And that weight has increased 12% since 2001, primarily because of uh, the introduction of safety regulations. And the average Indian fleet is only 1,032 kilograms, and an auto rickshaw weighs 500 kilograms. So these cars are actually polluting cars in the sense that they have a very high weight and therefore necessarily fuel consumption will be higher. And remember, you know, a, a normal person might weigh uh, something like 70 kilograms. So just imagine transporting one person in something weighing two and a half thousand kilograms. Now, why do these cars use uh, aluminum uh, in their bodies and so forth uh, and in the frame of the car? Well, because if they wanted to make a luxury car, they could not make it using steel because the weight would be much higher. Okay? And the problem with using aluminum is that it is not recyclable like steel is. And if you want to uh, find out more about the recyclability, you can uh, find this uh, lecture on my YouTube channel, uh, where uh, uh, an expert from Brunel University looks at the recycling of aluminum in cars. Also notice that these cars are incredibly expensive. Okay. So compared with my car, which, uh, you know, when I bought it, uh, cost about 1200, uh, sorry, 12,000 pounds. These are far more expensive cars. So these are not the cars 
which you would look for if you want to save the environment or uh, uh, be eco-friendly. Now I'll come back to this uh, uh, Tesla now. So people think that electric cars are going to save the environment. And you know, to some extent it is true because uh, you know, supposing that we get our electricity from green sources, then of course you can um, say that you've reduced the pollution by not burning fossil fuels. But the current state of electric cars is not good. And I'll illustrate that by the profits that Tesla made in the last quarter of 2021. Okay, so the total profit was $438 million. Uh, and remember, this is uh, the most one of the most valuable car companies in the world. OK, um, and of that, about 300 million went to Elon Musk, which is which is fine because, you know, this is his baby. Uh, but one hundred and one million dollars of the profit came from Bitcoin sales, sales, nothing to do with the production of a car and a much bigger component. $500 million came by selling environmental credits to car manufacturers who are making dirty cars. Okay. Now, you have to question whether this is an ethical way of trying to solve the environmental problem. So the vast majority of money from making those Teslas came from the sales of environmental credits. So the net profit was actually much smaller than you might imagine. Now it is it is true that uh, you know if you don't um, uh, if you don't use fossil fuels, then of course you will cut down the CO2 load. But the electricity then must come from green sources, and right now uh, we we still burn huge quantities of fossil fuels. Uh, to generate electricity. So, for example, one of the biggest markets for Teslas is in China. And China has the largest CO2 emissions from elect uh, electricity production. They have huge numbers of coal fired power stations. Okay. So, electric cars are only a solution if you make them cheap, right? Uh, not very heavy. And you use electricity, which comes from green sources. So, uh, and one of the most effective green sources is wind power. So um, there have been uh, occasions in Britain, long periods, where we have used zero coal because uh, of the largest offshore wind turbine generation facility that has been installed by the UK. And by, uh, by the next decade, 40% of all electricity for the UK will be generated by wind power. Now, what do we mean by light rating? Uh, do we mean that uh, you know, we must have lightweight materials or should we reduce the absolute uh, weight of a car? You know, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know, uh, an average person might weigh about 70 kilograms and the car that they're traveling in, uh, if they are rich, would weigh about two and a half thousand kilograms or more. Well, uh, this is a picture I took in India of an auto rickshaw. And an auto rickshaw has a weight of about 290 kilograms. Amazingly environmentally friendly. OK, 290 kilograms. And when you add a few people, you know, its weight can go up to five or six hundred kilograms. So just look at the ratio of the weight of people to uh, to the weight of the actual uh, vehicle. So this is an incredibly environmentally friendly way of transport, even if it has a two uh, two stroke engine and so forth and so on. Uh, the fuel consumption from translating a small weight is obviously going to be less than the fuel consumption of translating a very large, large weight. And here's another picture which I took uh, at uh, the Tata Steel Laboratories. This car belongs to Chiradip Ghosh. And 
its curb weight is 630 kilograms. Okay. And if I exaggerate Chiradip's uh, weight uh, to 170 kilograms, uh, he isn't 170 kilograms, then the total weight would be 800 kilograms. And this is, uh, uh, you know, a really nice concept for weatherproof uh, transport of a whole family of people. Now, there may be many other reasons why, uh, you know, these, these cars have not been successful. But if it was available in the UK, I would buy this car. Okay, it looks beautiful and it has a really uh, nice philosophy behind it. You know, Ratan Tata, when he thought of creating this car, it was, he saw a whole family going on a scooter in heavy rain. Okay, so his idea was to create a, a nice cheap car. So this is the perfect solution to light weighting. That means that we use cars which are actually not heavy. Okay? Uh, and you know, the vast majority of journeys that we do are really a small distance. And you know, don't need excessive luxury for small distances. And what I would suggest to Tata is that they should resume production of these cars, but electrify them using lithium ion batteries rather than lead acid batteries. And, you know, I think that would make a big difference to the environmental impact of automobiles in India. Now, I mentioned lithium ion batteries uh, and, you know, they form the uh, powerhouse for all electric cars, except a very few which are based on a fuel cell concept. And this is an area where metallurgy can contribute enormously, and I'll explain why uh, in the next uh, few slides. So at the moment, very few are recycled, 5% are recycled, uh, and these batteries last for a, a, a long time. Uh, so we have, uh, we have uh, you know, a long time interval to establish a recycling technology, because in 2030 in the UK, all petrol and diesel cars will be banned, right? They're all new. You won't be able to sell a new petrol or diesel car. And by 2030, it's forecast there will be 30 million electric cars in Europe. So we haven't faced the issue of recycling the lithium ion batteries as yet because they are functioning very well. And it will be some time before, you know, um, you end up with a huge pile of lithium ion batteries. And this is uh, the uh, picture from the Nissan Leaf, which is a smaller and more affordable uh, electric car. And this is the battery infrastructure here. And, you know, the battery, I, I forget exactly how much it weighs, but it's of the order of 450 kilograms. Now, these are not easy to recycle. Okay. And they contain... Uh, precious uh, commodities which should be recycled. So there are a number of possibilities on how we as metallurgists can contribute to this. Uh, so pyrometallurgy, that means you burn the thing and you smelt it, would allow you to recover an alloy of cobalt, iron, copper and nickel. And then you would have to do some work to separate out the key elements because they are not present inside the battery as an alloy, but as uh, separate components of the battery, uh, even combined as compounds. And the slag that you produce from pyrometallurgy would contain aluminum, lithium, and manganese, and then you would need to separate those out as well. So a huge amount of science needs to be done and it needs to be done now in order to prepare for the point where we end up with a large amount of uh, re, uh, um, material to recycle. I would suggest uh, this publication, which is a really, really nice summary of what needs to be done in this area. So, you know, if you have a department of uh, material science, you should have someone working on this area now rather than later. Now, pyrometallurgy means you burn off actually things like the plastics, the electrolytes, and some of the 
lithium salts, and that's not a good thing. Uh, but the process can deal with a variety of battery types. You know, you're just putting these into a smelter, and you know the the, the battery types in the Nissan Leaf are not the same as the batteries in the Tesla or in the um, Tata Motors uh, um, cars. Now, the other uh, option is uh, physical separation, uh, where you would uh, you would actually unassemble the battery and take away the different components and that is a very very good way of uh, doing things because um, you can then um, recycle the components themselves okay but um, these batteries can catch fire and uh, there might be toxic uh, things inside the battery and therefore you would need enormous safety infrastructure and a lot of uh, manual labor to do this. But it would be the best way of actually recycling components. Now, hydrometallurgy is when you actually leach out the different uh, parts of the battery. Uh, so here, for example, is uh, you know recovery of lithium and cobalt from a lithium cobalt oxide. And all this needs to be studied. And direct recycling uh, is not just of components, but actually of replacing some things inside the battery and then using, uh, using the recycled battery for the same purpose. So my suggestion is that this area needs focus. And you know, if, if there are people who have worked on extraction metallurgy or, or chemical metallurgy, or corrosion, they would have all the skills that you need to do the research and establish a center for recycling of lithium ion batteries. Now, of course, uh, if you build the right sort of infrastructure in a city, for example, cycle parts which are safe and so on, then it's a very good way to use bicycles and therefore not only get healthy, but save fossil fuel. So here, for example, is Nirupam Chakrabarti, who you might know from IIT Kharagpur, and he's soon going to go to the Czech Republic for two years to work uh, at a university there. And you can see the quality of the cycle path here, okay? It's separated from the road, and you can safely cycle without colliding with heavy lorries, etc. So supposing you took Jamshedpur, all right? And from the center of Jamshedpur, you establish cycle paths and you banned, uh, banned cars, individual cars, as opposed to public transport. Then you could slowly create the infrastructure where people start to cycle to work rather than go by car or by bus. And of course, schools, uh, school transportation can uh, also involve cycling. So here is a, a more, more complicated uh, bicycle where you see everybody on this is cycling. Okay. And this is an image I took in uh, Berlin. Of course, they are having a lot of fun by doing this collectively. But you know, if you are transporting children to school, they could all be cycling. So these are ideas which uh, break uh, the paradigm, okay. the paradigm, the pattern in which we have come to live, where, you know, for short journeys, we take a car journey rather than walk or cycle. I now want to move into technology and how we can break uh, our conventional thinking in technology as well. And once again, you know, Elon Musk uh, features because this is uh, the Starship uh, that he's building. Um, it's called SpaceX, and ultimately, it's uh, it will be designed to take people to Mars. But in the meantime, you know, if you want to establish a moon base or, or take heavy loads into space and then recover your launch vehicle, uh, this is the Starship, which already has performed. Now, originally, the idea was to make this from a composite, uh, a carbon fiber composite. But very quickly, they realized that's not a good solution 
because for example uh, in mars there is a, the density of the atmosphere is less than that on earth so in order for a rocket to enter the atmosphere uh, it it has to go at a glancing angle which will cause a lot of heat and composites uh, will not survive that you know they are basically bonded together carbon fibers uh, and similarly aluminum would not survive that uh, you know as you know aluminum is light but it is also precipitation hardened or, or some other factor to harden it and if you heat it up then you're going to lose its metal metallurgical integrity so this is actually made from stainless steel okay this this rocket is made from stainless steel welded together and you know if before elon musk you ask somebody whether you would have a rocket which is made from steel they would have uh, a material scientist in particular would have said you know uh, you are talking nonsense because you have to use a lightweight material steel is strong and therefore you can make it lightweight by using less of it this is his uh, reusable interplanetary vehicle he calls it uh, the starship and you know it's designed to cope with freezing and scorching temperatures and mars has a thin uh, atmosphere so you have to enter at a glancing angle to ensure that you have sufficient drag and of course that leads to heat uh, and even with the steel there is a liquid methane pump under the surface of the starship to cool cool the steel so none of these materials can actually cope right aluminum and composite and furthermore they are more expensive and composite certainly is not recyclable and that's uh, one of the problems that needs to be faced uh, when it comes to wind turbines because the blades of a wind turbine are made from composite what do you do with that after their finished service so steel has no challenges but it does lead to co2 production in a big way all right and this kind of an increase in steel consumption is not sustainable if you want to avoid uh, the worst effects of climate change which will have the greatest impact on the poorest nations of the world who can least mitigate the effects of uh, climate change okay so this kind of consumption is indecent we need to reduce the steel consumption of steel and just to give you an example of uh, uh, the construction industry you know this is a massive steel beam which uses 1300 kilograms per meter 1300 kilograms per meter of steel and this is used for making very tall buildings extremely tall buildings now why do we need extremely tall buildings we don't need them you know people are constructing tall buildings just out of fashion and those buildings also require huge uh, uh, concrete foundation which is another material which is uh, uh, you know has a heavy co2 burden so i'm going to show you an example uh, of how to reduce steel consumption without losing the capability of having a high quality life okay because steel improves the quality of life in so many ways that we are not going to stop using it but if we can make better use of the steel then we can use less quantities of steel uh, i'm going to show you actual data from the construction of a building which uses a better steel than the normal steel and yet manages to reduce the overall cost so this is uh, from work done by cbmm in brazil uh, and this is the final building that was constructed and the building uh, is constructed on a steel frame which has these three types of uh, girders uh, this and this use a high quality uh, when i mean, mean high quality i mean a stronger micro alloy steel okay so it is it is more expensive than a normal steel uh, and this is uh, your normal steel which they use for the braces here and the building exists okay i have seen it so by by using the stronger micro alloy steel which is represented in green here you actually reduce the size of the beams that you need to use 
Okay, so this is engineering design. You know, you give the engineer parameters that look this steel is better than this, then you can, uh, they can redesign your building to cope with a higher strength and a smaller amount of steel. So this beam uses 22% less steel, or in the whole building construction, 22% less steel was used. And even though the microalloy steel is more expensive than the ordinary steel, there is a 17% cost saving because you're using less steel. There's a 1.8 gigajoules of energy saving and 128 gigagrams of carbon dioxide saved as a consequence. So, you know, if you combine engineering design with using a better steel, and we have the technology for better steels, and, uh, you know, if, if even better steels need to be created, we can do that, I believe. Then you can actually reduce the consumption of steel. So instead of 2 billion tons, you know, if you had a 20% reduction in the amount of steel used, that would immediately drop to 1.6 billion tons. That's a 400 million tons saving of steel and the associated um, carbon dioxide, which is about three tons per ton of steel. So you're saving 1,200 billion tons of CO2 if you actually use better steel. Now, I mentioned engineering design because, you know, th this whole subject is not about a material alone, but about a whole system. And I'm going to show you a, a little video recording now of a different kind of a beam design for construction. Now, here is a beam which is asymmetrical. Uh, the length at the top is different from the length at the bottom. And the idea here is that instead of putting the floor on the top, you would insert the floor through the sides. And in that way, you avoid the need to fire protect the web region. Uh, and fire protection is uh, extremely costly because you actually have to enable the building to survive for more than one hour in a fire scenario. The additional advantage is that you save in terms of the height of the buildings. Here, here is that beam again. And the idea is that for the same height of a building, you can have more flows, plus you, uh, you don't need any fire protection in this region uh, because you are slotting the floors in and the services can go through the floors themselves. So it's a very neat and tidy solution. This whole section is actually rolled out of solid steel slabs, a hot rolled out of solid steel slabs. So there's no welding involved here. Okay, now this is a building in Taiwan that I was fortunate to be able to visit when it was under construction. So here I am, and this is a Professor J.R. Yang, who was one of my first PhD students and now is a big professor at uh, the Taiwan National University, and Professor C.H. Young, who is in the construction department of, the, uh, of another university in Taiwan, and he was also in Cambridge at one time. And these are dear young students, okay? So because I knew them, I was able to go into this building, which is 101 stories high, during the construction stage. Now, there is a problem with uh, tall buildings, okay? And uh, what I want to show you is additive manufacturing at its best, okay? Um, so you must have heard a lot about additive manufacturing, but I'm going to show you examples of additive manufacturing on a huge scale in the context of this building and in another context. So the problem with tall buildings is that uh, they are subject to wind forces and in, in the Taiwan building also to earthquakes. So if you just take the elastic deflection of the structure, which is made from steel, okay, then that accumulates as you go up the building. And, you know, if you do nothing, then you would have a deflection of one meter due to wind at the very top. And that is, uh, you know, you can't actually use a building like that. And just to illustrate this, uh, I was also in a building in Moscow on the 60th floor having dinner. And 
there was a chandelier at the top and it was a bad weather day. So this movie shows how the chandelier is vibrating as a consequence of wind on the 60th floor of a building in Moscow. So these are not one meter because this is only 60, uh, uh, roughly 60 floors high. And the wind wasn't as bad as the worst case scenario. But you can see that just elastic deflections cause the building to move, uh, to uh, vibrate effectively at a low frequency. So how do we cope with this? Well, in the building in Taiwan, there's an ingenious structure. So there is this uh, steel ball, which weighs something like uh, 900 tons, which is suspended from the 92nd floor, uh, and it's connected to uh, dampers. So this is uh, known as a tuned damper. That means the mass of the ball, et cetera, is designed to compensate for the uh, forces due to wind and earthquake. And this is actually the steel ball, which is made from steel plate cut into circular sections and joined together. So this is a 900 ton object, which is additively manufactured layer by layer by putting the different sections of steel on top of each other, welding them and making a ball. Now, this story has become a huge tourist attraction. Uh, this picture I took uh, when the building was under construction, but they have since then painted this golden here you are and there's a gallery where visitors can come and observe this so these are incredibly strong steel ropes something of the order of uh, two gigapascals in strength uh, made from drawn perlite and this is your additively manufactured massive steel ball which is connected at the bottom to these dampers which contain silicon oil and the whole thing is tuned to the required resonance frequency of the building so this is one of the largest uh, additively manufactured uh, components and uh, made in metal. And by the simple technology that you take, you know, slabs of steel in the correct shape and you stack them up. And that really is the concept of additive manufacturing. And in the same building, uh, they've made some concrete here which has a density of just 0 0.9, less than that of water, by mixing concrete and porous clay from the bottom of a dam. So these, these uh, features would not be possible if the density was of normal concrete. Okay? And that was, this, this has been designed by uh, Professor C.H. Young, who I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to show you now uh, uh, another example of additive manufacturing. Uh, of steel, uh, again on a grand scale. So you don't need to think about additive manufacturing as just a tiny component being made by putting a laser or a welding wire. You can make huge objects by additive manufacturing. So this is a, a steam turbine and uh, you know it is much longer than illustrated in this image. And this is uh, Tracy Cool, who was my PhD student. Now when you make large objects, they will contain chemical segregation because you know you you cast them and there's no way in which you can get rid of long range segregation by homogenization so so if you look at this ingot you know there's there's quite a lot of segregation uh, the scale here is half a meter now this is also a very large component and you can see that there is almost no segregation now, how has this been made? Well, you continuously cast the steel as normal and you cut it up into chunks. You stack the chunks up in a, in a vacuum and uh, you then make welds between the plates. You then forge them together. So by doing this, you cut down any effects of long range segregation. And this, these, the pictures that follow are real pictures of massive components made in this way to avoid segregation. So this is at uh, Shenyang, uh, the Institute for Metals Research in Shenyang. Look at the scale here. And I deliberately took pictures with people 
so that you can see the scale of the structure that is made by stacking these plates together, joining them up, and then forging them into shape. My point is, you know, if you use your imagination to solve a problem, then you can create radical technologies which, uh, which will change the way in which uh, we work. And this is a, a steel object with the problem of chemical segregation completely removed. I'm going to show you another example where imagination features heavily. So there's a class of steels known as the TWIP steels. That means twinning induced plasticity steels. And they have remarkable properties. They start off quite weak, uh, but a huge amount of elongation and uh, a, a work hardening rate, which means that you don't get uh, plastic instabilities and therefore fracture occurs at a very large strain. The reason why we get this nice work hardening, which delays plastic instability, is that as you deform, you get mechanical twinning of the type illustrated here. And that mechanical twinning divides up the parent grains into ever smaller grains. So, Effectively, that gives you work hardening uh, because uh, you know you need to think about this like a dynamic hole patch effect, where you are reducing the grain size by partitioning the grain with these mechanical twins. So, on the face of it, it has uh, excellent properties. Now, these are the sort of components that you would use in a car uh, for safety. So if you have, uh, say, a head-on accident, then these objects will deform, and in doing so, they will absorb energy and therefore, you know, to some extent, protect the passenger compartment. And the one on this side is uh, made from steel, uh, and on this side, uh, it's uh, a composite material where energy absorption occurs by the tearing apart of the composite. So. Uh, the twip steel that I showed in the previous slide um, might be suitable for this application. Uh, and this is an example of a twip steel which has been tested in the same sort of scenario that uh, I showed in the movie. Now, the pro there is a problem here which uh, Wolfgang Black identified, and that is that, you know, the twip steel only absorbs sufficient energy after a large amount of strain. And a large amount of strain only happens in the most bent regions here. Whereas, you know, if you had a material which started off quite strong and had a stress strain curve like this, then it would absorb much more energy. So it turns out that it's not actually suitable for this crash resistant uh, application simply because it starts off quite weak and then reaches a strength of 1.2 gigapascals. And the way in which this component is designed means that you do not get uniform deformation. So much of this remains at a low strain. So uh, do you abandon this idea? Well, you know, um, this work uh, that I'm going to show you is done in Germany and it's incredibly innovative. So. What they did is design a method so that you get uniform deformation. So these objects here are made from twip steel. They are, they are cylinders of twip steel. And they are designed so that in a crash, they would become extruded. Okay? So that extrusion gives you uniform deformation throughout the material and you get much better energy absorption. So I'm going to show you a movie uh, and acknowledge uh, the German uh, rail industry for this. So this is how um, the TWIP steel is being used to absorb energy in a crash resistant scenario. So during that crash, uh, the TWIP steel is being extruded and therefore you are using the material in such a way that you get uniform deformation. And I thought this was an amazingly clever way of using the material. 
So in today's talk, uh, I have tried very hard to show you that, first of all, steel has no challenges at all. But there is no doubt that we need to reduce consumption. And to a large extent, this can be done by a better use of steels rather than, for example, by carbon capture, which uses energy itself. Uh, and there is no possibility of producing all the steels that we use using hydrogen, uh, because the hydrogen would have to be generated from green electricity. And I think we need legislation to increase the cost of steels. And I have a number of ideas on how you could do that um, as an individual country or as an international collaboration. You know, uh, one simple idea is that if you buy something, uh, then uh, and doesn't matter which country it comes from, then there is a tax associated with it, which depends on the content of steel. Because as I said to you, steel has no challenges. It is such a successful material that people want to use more and more and more. So we need to do something about this and bring back steel production to about 800 million tons per annum. But, you know, the sort of ideas that I've tried to explain to you uh, are about thinking in a different way. For example, with additive manufacturing, you could do additive manufacturing by taking sheets and then stacking them up and joining them together and forging them and so on. Uh, rather than just by depositing it from a powder, etc. And you can create your own paths in research and focus on a technological need because that tells you that there is a complicated path you need to follow in your work. And new industries, uh, the particular one I think is very promising is on the recycling of lithium ion batteries. So I will stop now and uh, I'll be very happy to answer questions. Before I open the talk for uh, discussion or question answers, I would like to make a few observations, uh, not repeat all that that you have said, but uh, the links that you had established uh, with our department and where Dr. Uh, Rampadmanna is continuing to work on similar ideas. So that's uh, one thing. And you referred to recycling and at the end also you were referring to recycling. Uh, we have one younger colleague in the department, Professor KK Singh, who works on uh, recycling. And uh, he was recycling uh, or recovering uh, precious metals from printed uh, circuits, boards and so on. But I'm sure uh, he can take up this kind of uh, work. And uh, that would uh, definitely add to what our department has a motto. Uh, I don't know whether you had a chance to see it any time. We have a motto, let's create technologies for tomorrow. Or let us build technologies, build technologies for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And a department like this, and with the guidance or the help uh, with ideas from people like you, I'm sure the, the, the colleagues here can uh, take up that. What uh, it's for the benefit of uh, the younger students, I would like to say that Professor Bhadeshya's lecture has been uh, a, an integrated approach. Many of us, you might have seen during our work, uh, concentrate on one idea and try to sell that idea that this is the best, be it nanotechnology, be it whatever it may be. But he has shown you the importance of uh, having an integrated approach. And for the senior uh, colleagues for research ideas, he has given enough number of them. And for the young students, he has opened up a, an area where challenges are very intriguing uh, situations can be there in technology and how you can choose a career path in that. And so with these uh, few words, I would now request the young participants particularly to participate in the discussion. I'm working in the area of uh, recycling of electronic waste. 
and uh, recently i completed one project uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, professor jayson of the university of edinburgh and uh, that was under ukeri scheme and uh, we successfully collaborated uh, professor jayson had uh, experience of uh, recovering gold from synthetic uh, solution and uh, i uh, joined with him with uh, my successful research on delamination of printed circuit board so exposed metallic values and uh, all together we both uh, successfully recovered more than 97% of gold similarly 95% copper and nickel so uh, the uh, project uh, finally uh, completed with four metals recovery That's then right. Uh, after that we got a gcrf uh, project epsrc again from uk uh, uh, we have two collaborators edinburgh university and dundee university and uh, from india my uh, university is there and one uh, national institute of design is also involved into that so in that we are uh, making some you, you find application direct application from this waste so we are targeting the jewelry uh, uh, uh industry uh, but unfortunately due to covid 19 uh, it is on hold okay so now uh, uh, i'm uh, interested to know from you sir uh, because this is very uh, interesting for us and already we have started work on this lithium ion battery recycling two um, tech students current year they could not perform the uh, experiments but uh, cobalt as well as lithium both uh, recovery was our target and we are really very much interested so now my question rather i wish suggestion from you uh, how to uh, carry out uh, how to go ahead in this pandemic because everything is uh, uh, stuck and uh, in spite of our uh, enthusiasm and uh, students availability up to some extent Uh, we are not moving forward so your suggestion and what to do sir out of your vast experience i i think uh, the the most important thing is that you protect yourself uh, for the moment yeah for the moment everyone has to uh, doesn't matter what our research priorities are etc if you don't live then you can't do anything okay so in our university for example we have done completely online teaching for 18 months now including examinations and so on uh, we uh, allow 25% occupation in the department for research students isolated research students so only one person can be in the lab with many precautions for the moment you could you could write an extensive literature review for example on uh, lithium ion battery recycling just to gather all that information and that you can publish you know if you do a really good job uh, there's plenty of opportunity to publish no matter how lo- long your review is in any research the first step is you survey what has been done so now would be a good time to do that sort of work and of course you know you can look at theory as well so if if you can find some electrochemical theory which will help you in the process so the, i would like to draw up your attention only these two points one is steel foam another is the high entropy steel where we can try to achieve the low density aspect and at the same time microstructural design should be such that analogous to super alloy these two are my general but if the time permits i have another specific question yeah. so so regarding steel foam uh, as a method of getting rigidity Um, so the best way to get a rigid structure using steel is engineering design you know so a simple example is your corrugated roof um, and so on and, and steel foam is uh, will you know obviously you have to think of an application and if you think of an application then you need more than just the rigidity uh, so i would say uh, you know and of course i haven't done the work i would say that the material will be expensive and furthermore it will not have good structural integrity so yes question here yeah. um you were talking about the twist steel uh, twin induced that uh, plasticity 
Now, what is that uh, fundamental mechanism because of which there is a possibility? Because these are all PCC or FCC kind of structure. And uh, what is that uh, driving force that you get twins so often during yeah. this affirmation? That is uh, my point that uh, whether really uh, we get a deformation twin or uh, if we do the hit treatment, then we may get back to the annealing twin or both do it mechanical and annealing twin both. So if you can clarify on this issue. Yeah. yeah. So, so these are definitely mechanical twins. Okay. Uh, uh, before deformation, you don't see them. And after deformation, you see them. And you can even measure the shape change, the actual shear. So the simple explanation is, as you add manganese to iron, the stacking fault energy changes. So initially, you start to get epsilon martensite. Uh, if, you, if it's austenitic, you start to get hexagonal martensite, HCPI. And at some point, the fault energy becomes such that that transformation disappears. And no matter how much you deform, the trip steel stays austenitic, but it deforms by mechanical twinning. Yeah. So it will lead some kind of brittleness also? No, it's, uh, it's extremely ductile, uh, simply because um, uh, these twins are very, very thin. And their, their biggest effect is to divide the austenite into smaller and greater size. So you are introducing a work hardening capacity, and that that, that uh, delays the plastic instability that you get during tensile testing to a much longer strain. So essentially, manganese is the responsible element, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So can you think that in future graphene can replace steel? So um, uh, actually, on my on my website, there are videos explaining that and publications as well. So this is a complete nonsense. Um, so there is a fundamental uh, thermodynamic calculation that you can do that as you increase the size of a crystal, for example, a crystal of iron, okay, uh, from uh, less than a micrometer in size, it has a strength of something like 12 gigapascals. And as you increase the size, Thermodynamics tells you that you will have an equilibrium number of defects, so the strength collapses. And this work uh, is before 1950, uh, 56. Uh, we know that when you measure the strength of a very small particle, it will not be the same as the strength of a particle which is one millimeter in size. And many years ago, I wrote a paper on carbon nanotubes to show that it's complete nonsense to say that we'll be able to make ropes with a strength of 130 gigapascals for exactly the same reason. And I sent the paper to NASA, actually, because they were thinking about the space elevator concept. So basic thermodynamics tells you that if you rely on strength, uh, rely on perfection for strength, strength the disappears as soon as your particle or the number of atoms in your object becomes larger. And exactly the same applies to graphene. And I presented this talk at a graphene conference, actually. Um, so it's on my, in, on my website. So, you know, the scientists have unfortunately uh, focused on publicity more than on the science, because this story is known from before 1950, that you cannot maintain perfection in a crystal as the crystal becomes larger. And of course, the reason why they're doing this is to impress uh, funding authorities who don't understand science. Okay, but you know, if you do work in an honest way, then you will achieve what you claim at the beginning of the project, or you might achieve. Sir, in your last slide, you have said that steel have no challenges, and uh, in future we have to increase it, its cost. Sir, how we can increase its cost? Uh, then no one will buy it, sir. These products. Yeah, but that's the whole point. We don't want people to buy too much steel. Uh, so we want to make the same profit, otherwise the companies won't survive. So you have to put a tax on the use of steel, just like you have a tax. In Britain, we pay huge tax on petrol. Every time we buy petrol, there's a very large tax, far more than the cost of 
at all. And that means a big drive to increase fuel efficiency. Sir, what is the future of electric car, sir? In coming 10 years, the future of electric car, will it replace all the petrol and diesel running cars or not, sir? I have no doubt that it is the right way to go, but we need to make small and cheap electric cars. At the moment, uh, the focus is on things like Teslas and so on, which are ridiculously expensive. Sir, in steel, uh, which are the areas you think uh, still needs lots of research, sir, in coming years? So, so, so my aim in giving this lecture is for you to come up with totally different kinds of ideas. Yes, yeah, so I've given you examples of totally different kind of ideas. I want you to actually come up with ideas. Uh, what I'd like to know, uh, it is uh, regarding the twelve steel. So, uh, uh, it uh, so far uh, so far I know that. Uh, Interpenetrating twins in steels were reported by Jack Christians and Basinski way back in 1958 60. Mm -hmm. But they never mentioned in those papers twin steels and all this. Mm -hmm. And now we understand that uh, you, these twins are mostly deformation twins of mostly compound type deformation twins. And uh, by changing the deformation that you can. Uh, apply to the material, you can change the alignment of the twins also. So is there is there any solid theoretical approach which will help you in predicting beforehand that uh, this is how the steel should be designed and this is how the deformation should be imported to the steel so that uh, you can align those twins in such a way that you can maximize the uh, properties of the steel is I, I am not really aware of this. So if you could really guide me on that. It's a very, very good question. Uh, so uh, the trip steels uh, didn't exist um, when you know Jack Christian was doing his work and when Mahajan and Christian wrote that review in progress. Yes. In the science. Uh, but um, the concept of mechanical twinning, of course, was dealt with incredibly nicely in that review article that they wrote. Yeah. Uh, now, it is actually a physical deformation, and it's exactly like mitocytic transformation, where you, you get a change in, uh, in the case of mitocyte, you get a change in crystal structure, but also it's a physical deformation. Okay. Now, the twinning shear is much larger than in mitocyte. You know, it's about uh, one over square root of two, whereas in mitocyte, it's uh, about 0.26. So, there is no doubt that when you pull the material, the twins that should form are those which relieve the stress. Uh, so you will tend to get a selection of twins. But bear in mind that this is a polycrystalline material. Uh, if you were working on a single crystal, um, then that would uh, yeah, you can, you get aligned yeah. twins. Yeah. But in a polycrystalline material, to maintain integrity, you need five different slip, uh, five different deformation systems to operate at the same time. So it's unlikely that you get a great deal of alignment by applying stress, but you might get some selection. So, so I mean to say, you mean to say, as you as you cross the grain boundary, the twin alignments uh, will differ, even though there might be the angular relationship between two consecutive twins might remain the same. Yes. And the second question is, are these twins still mostly compound twin or there are examples of type 1 or type 2 twins also? No, I think the symmetry of the FCC lattice uh, is such that you know, the easiest twinning mode is uh, favored. Okay. All right, thank you, sir. Hello. Uh, hello, this is uh, Madhumanti Vattacharya. I am an assistant professor from IIT Dhanbad. Okay. Um, I have a uh, very basic question, uh, somewhat related to what Professor Mukhopadhyay asked. Uh, right. the, 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 we have seen that when we add manganese to twip steel, the stacking right. fault energy decreases. Similarly, the effect is noticed in case of the nickel addition. Right. So what is the physics behind uh, having manganese lowering the uh, stacking fault energy of the FCC matrix. Right. What does what do these two particular elements do uh, in in case of us night matrix? Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question. I could tell you, you know, that manganese 
lowers the free energy of the HCP ion mm -hmm. relative to FCC. But then you can ask, okay, why does it lower the energy of HCP ion relative to um, FCC? Uh, so you could do some first principles calculations, but they still don't give you the sort of insight that uh, we get from ordinary discussion on why it actually does lower. All I can say is that everything indicates that it stabilizes uh, the HTP structure, but not. We were talking about dynamic hole pitch through deformation twins. So right. we can we can kind of use the deformation twinning as a grain refining method during the deformation. Absolutely. Similarly, similarly, when we anneal the structure, the annealing twins intersecting the austenite grain boundaries can act as like a zerpening kind of uh, thing. Well, the, the only problem is that uh, when you talk about a grain boundary and the movement of a grain boundary, that will involve diffusion. You know, the boundaries are not much of a barrier during recrystallization. Um, mm -hmm. Grain boundaries and twin boundaries are not much of a barrier because diffusion happens. If you had uh, particles which don't dissolve, during the annealing, then they basically cause the boundaries to bow. Um, so it's it's not likely, uh, although an experiment would be nice, that annealing twins themselves act as barriers. Uh, so uh, like transparent aluminum, is it possible to think of transparent steel? It's a very good, uh, very good question. Um, so, uh, the reason why uh, a metal is not transparent is because we have these electron energy levels and it's very easy for an electron to be promoted to another level. So when light falls, you know, the light is absorbed uh, by this process. So in order to make it transparent, you would need to make it an insulator. In other words, put a band gap. So that can happen if your particle gets to if your iron particle gets to less than about five nanometers, sorry. Um, and that is predicted by uh, the MOT uh, metal insulator transition. Now, the problem is five nanometers. So the wavelength of light is uh, 10 times, uh, 100 times bigger than that. So what does then transparency mean? Because if you actually put the particles together to make a sheet, then it would become a metal again and become opaque. So it's probably fundamentally impossible. To do. So my question is, in the uh, from the point of view of physical metallurgy or researching the fundamental physical metallurgy of steels, how exhausted or unexplored is the field started by 2021? Yeah. So this uh, omega transformation that you talked about is a misinterpretation of the electron diffraction patterns. Uh, so what happens is that when you have an inclined interface, you are actually getting double diffraction. And uh, there, there are uh, periodically over the years, you will get papers which think that the double diffraction is because of an omega transformation. And uh, in my latest book, which is called The Theory of uh, Transformations in Steels, um, I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, I have a section yes, on, section on um, the illusory omega transformation to point out the error. Uh, and I pointed that out in 1987, but every time someone buys a new electron microscope and uses it, they misinterpret the double diffraction to imply uh, an omega transformation. And uh, I think the most recent uh, such paper was from China. Yeah. Yes, sir, exactly. Mm. Uh, as you have discussed about uh, the uh, additive manufactured trip steel. So, sir, do you think there is a directional mechanical property of that steel in along the uh, parallel direction and perpendicular of the sea? Yes, it, so, it, it, uh, it is uh, well established uh, that uh, in when you do layer by layer and line by uh, line by line, you will get some directionality. But, you know, the biggest, uh, biggest thing you need to focus on in additive manufacturing is to produce complex shapes. Uh, you know, you can't do certain shapes at all 
without additive manufacturing. So if you have a re-entrant angle, okay, so just to give you an example, if you look at a chess piece for a castle, if you can make that by additive manufacturing, then you can have all the doors, windows inside the castle, this staircase and so on, which you cannot actually make by any other method. So the uniqueness of additive manufacturing is that you can produce very complex shapes. And uh, General Electric, for example, has an entire factory making uh, combustor uh, components for the jet engine using uh, manufacturing. Uh, just I wanted to ask a question which is uh, like most common for every undergrad fresher student that uh, how can we explore this uh, department of metallurgy in a best possible way sir as we are like a uh, we have just stepped inside it how can we sir yeah thank you so i'm, I'm not sure i fully understand um, i think he wanted to know or your suggestion that uh, being a sophomore how can he find what are the interesting areas in the Department of Metallurgy okay. Engineering. The only way, the only way to discover new ideas, uh, well, there are two ways. One, one is um, you need to do a huge amount of reading of what has already been done and you will find discrepancies, okay? So as soon as you do a literature review, you will find discrepancies and problems. And then you, uh, uh, and you will also find misinterpretations. And that really sparks your imagination, okay? So the best way is not to ask somebody on what ideas I should work on because top-led research usually is boring. So you find your own ideas by doing a great deal of reading, finding discrepancies. You will automatically find discrepancies. Now, this is hard work, correct? Right? It's hard work. But think about it like this, that if you do a really good job, then you can write it up and publish a literature review and you will very quickly know more than your professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think this uh, omega transformations which has been reported in other alloy system like in zirconium or in titanium or even before that the high pressure omega transformation they are all uh, artifacts of uh, uh, electron uh, diffraction? Not at all, not at all. Yeah, so, because I can refer to uh, the work done by Steve Sass. Uh, there they clearly shown that the uh, dovetail pattern keeps on moving on 1 upon 3, 2 upon 3 uh, over the reciprocal lattice vector. So they cannot be so mathematical, isn't it? No, but, but uh, I, think, I think I'm not saying that omega transformation doesn't exist. In titanium, for example, it's very common if you, mm -hmm. if you have a certain amount of alloying. Uh, uh, but it is a very strange transformation that, you know, if you look at the uh, set of planes, uh, mm -hmm. two planes out of three will collapse into each other. Okay. Exactly. So it causes an uh, enormous uh, uh, change in symmetry and properties. And it's very well established in titanium alloys in particular. And I, I forget the name of uh, who was the director of uh, BARC. Uh, the yes, Vanity. Yes, Vanity. Yes, Vanity. He did work on that as well. Yeah. So, uh, the omega transformation which has been observed in zirconium, titanium, they are pretty much well established. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You have shown as an innovator, not only just an innovator, uh, out of box thinking, the emphasis that you have made is very important. That it is always important to think out of box, conventional uh, thinking. You may uh, be aware or may not be, but one of my senior uh, colleagues, uh, late Professor Ramchandra Rao, used to tell me when I was a PhD student with him, he used to say, Sastri, don't read too much. Think about and then you will get new ideas. <laughs> OK, that's so, another way. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure uh, the youngsters, as well as uh, all the senior uh, and colleagues, uh, researchers, have enjoyed uh, Professor Bhattacharya's talk. So actually, yeah. I would now like to invite Manna, sir, as he was the person who, who could like arrange this lecture for us. So I'd like to invite Manna, sir, to give a vote of thanks. 
So, dear participants, on behalf of Department of Metallurgical Engineering, IIT BHU, and on Nation 2021, Metallurgy Society, IIT BHU, IIM Baranasi Chapter, and Student Affiliate Chapter, IIM Baranasi, I extend my hearty thanks to Professor Sir HKDH Bhadesia for kindly agreeing and delivering an outstanding lecture on breaking paradigm in steel technologies. He has blessed our students by his kind words and knowledge, as well as many other students all over the country. For information of students, as he has mentioned, I visited his laboratory in 2011 and spent about three months. I have many interactions with him and he, he has visited us during NMD ATM 2013. On behalf of department, I would like to request Sir Vadesia if he can find some time later to visit our department in future. I also thank all other participants for patiently enjoying his lecture. I thank my beloved teacher, Professor Jivya Sastri, for nicely conducting this session. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you Professor. Okay. Thank you, Harry.